Katie and I'm here today for another tea time in books and it has definitely been a while since I've done one of these but I'm back again and this one is on a specific theme. All of these books um, have to do with settings um, in Southern California so I thought it would be really cool to wherever I live and even visit to do like a time and place thing so to read books from the year like a building is built um and that i happen to live at the time and also the area of course so i've done that with where i currently live so um the building i live in is um, from 1927 and so as you may have already seen, I made a video all about books from 1927 that I read and that was really fun. And I live in Los Angeles, so I chose some books from in and around Los Angeles, pretty much Southern California, um, to read as well. And that was interesting because I actually grew up in Southern California. Um, but mostly in Orange County and I've only spent the past year in LA um, but even then I never read books set in California I thought um, that was kind of funny looking back on my reading that that's kind of a rare setting and there really aren't that many books um, set here I think it's because it's not a very old part of the world perhaps um, maybe there are more books set here just not to my reading taste since i tend to stick with you know things set in the past or written in the past um but it was really interesting reading books from an area that i now live in and also kind of grew up in and um this has been an interesting experience so far so i will talk to you today about those books but first of all as usual i will show you um, what I have baked for our tea time and all of that. So, the books to the side. Mm -hmm. So, um, I wanted to be on theme with my baking this time, and I couldn't think of anything that was like a dessert that um, California is known for. I, I thought about this and like wow I've lived here forever I have no idea I looked it up it was kind of a weird list like apparently hot fudge sundaes are very Californian um I thought that was weird because yes there are hot fudge sundaes in a lot of places uh, they are very popular but I thought maybe that was more of like an American thing so if you live elsewhere in America tell me are hot fudge sundaes big there or is that actually a California thing and I never knew um but that wasn't baking so <laughs> forget hot fudge sundaes I found this thing called chiffon cake and I had never heard of it even though apparently it is associated with California um and apparently it is associated with California because the guy who created it lived here and he created it in um, 1927, which is funny because that's the year of the building I live in. So it was super perfect, both from the year and the place. And so uh, here's what it looks like. It's just kind of a fluffy cake is what I would say. It's similar to angel food cake. And I felt like I was doing something kind of dangerous by choosing this as um, what I was going to bake today because um, I have made angel food cake and it turned out like absolutely horrible just like pretty much inedible and it looked horrible too um, but you know I'm kind of determined to <laughs> figure things out and chiffon cake was a little different to make um, and it did take a couple tries with um, one of the steps I had to <laughs> redo um, but it ended up okay. I don't think it's perfect by any means. It's definitely edible and I, um, I like how it, it looks and stuff. So let's taste it and see what I think. I definitely think it looks like it needs something with it, you know, like strawberries or something, but I don't have that on hand. Yeah, I like it. 
there is vanilla in it so there's definitely like a vanilla flavor and yeah it's only like a little bit sweet and definitely fluffy um kind of texture it does need something with it though but i'm one of those people like i definitely have a sweet tooth but i don't like super duper sweet things so i'm okay with stuff that's like just sort of sweet without anything on it so let me know if you're someone like that too and of course i always bake without gluten or dairy so that might be reassuring to some of you out there with dietary restrictions as well that you can bake good things maybe it's harder i don't know because i don't bake with normal ingredients um and then i have peppermint tea as usual okay so let's talk about books so the first book i read um has to do with old hollywood so I kind of got a feel by these books like what is Southern California known for and I feel like just the, the topics of these books kind of tell you and of course Hollywood um, is one of the big things of Southern California and LA in particular and so the book I read first was Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates and this was published in 2000 and so this follows the life um, it is a fictional account of the life of Norma Jean Baker turned Marilyn Monroe of course and this takes place from her very early childhood until her early death so um, from the 30s to the early 60s and um, Marilyn was uh, born and raised in LA so not only was like the Hollywood part set here, um, but most of this was set here because her childhood took place here as well. And to be honest with you, before reading this, I did not have a strong interest in Marilyn. I didn't know that much about her. She never particularly struck me as um, someone I wanted to, I don't know, just um, pay a lot of attention to or watch a lot of her movies or anything like that. I had only seen three of her movies before. I had seen um, Niagara, Some Like It Hot a few times, and uh, The Prince and the Showgirl. And I watched the last one because I had seen um, a movie they had made about her. I forget what it was called, um, but you know, a few years ago or, or something. And it was about the filming of The Prince and the Showgirl. So I'd seen that and then was curious about that movie. And other than that, that was it. And so I went into this like not a huge fan, like just having seen a few things. And I came out of this quite a fan, like I appreciate her a lot more and it did inspire me to watch a lot more of her movies. I haven't watched all of them, but I would like to uh, for the most part, um, but I've watched a lot more uh, during the reading of this. So this was kind of uh, one of those books that inspired me to watch a lot of movies. So maybe it even took me longer to read because of that. Um, but that was really fun. And so, this book, um, it was excellently done. I really, really loved the execution of this, and I thought it was very thorough, um, and just a very sympathetic account of this woman's life and just delving into her psyche and all of that, and really portraying her as a human being um and not only was this a wonderful account of this famous woman's life but also kind of account of hollywood and how big hollywood is in american culture at one point oat said that hollywood and movies are america's religion and i thought that was interesting because we do place so much emphasis on hollywood and the stars that come out of hollywood and we have done that for a long time and just how we do that but like there's a lot of problems in Hollywood and and um, yeah just the problematic things behind the smoke and mirrors of Hollywood and of course particularly and how it exploits women um, Marilyn being one of them how it over sexualizes women how they make so much women or uh, money so much money off of these women stars um, but then the stars themselves aren't making that much money and just how that's kind of a corrupt system and you know I'm sure they haven't done that with everybody and they still don't do that with everybody but 
you know, there's always been a lot of stories coming out of Hollywood, even today, of problematic things and sexual exploitation and stuff like that. And Marilyn was definitely a victim of that. And so with Marilyn, her childhood and teenage years were the hardest to read about. Um, her whole life is kind of a sad one. Um, although glamorous, you know, like she does, she becomes very famous and so perhaps some of it is somewhat uplifting or, or helpful, but definitely there's a lot of tragedy and sadness and just messed up things in her life and her childhood and teenage years were very sad to read about. Um, I found her teenage years particularly hard hitting because she obviously has grown up with a lot of abandonment issues and just, you know, a completely absent father and then a mother definitely not being anything she, um, she needs. Her mother is very absent and ends up in a mental asylum. Um, when Marilyn is very young and Marilyn gets passed back and forth between foster families and ends up in an orphanage and all of that. Um, this book, I will say, doesn't cover well, it's a very big book and it can't cover everything. So it doesn't cover like every foster family she actually was with, apparently. It doesn't cover all of her romantic affairs, but it does cover her three marriages and a little bit um, of the other people she saw. And it doesn't go in depth into all of her movies, just some of them, because to do that would just um, take much longer. And this book was very large already, over 900 pages. And, um, so her, going back to her teenage years, um, she obviously suffered from a lot of abandonment issues and she just wants the love of men so bad. She wants this approval. She need, she's very needy um, and will do so much um, for their approval and just needs to be with someone basically. And that was difficult to read about, um, you know, and for anyone that has any level of abandonment issues, I think Marilyn had it very rough, honestly. Um, at my, I don't know if it'd be triggering, but definitely reminiscent and of those issues. And you know, I know, like in my teenage years, I, I think I, I suffered from some of those issues and acted in certain ways that reminded, um, that Marilyn reminded me of. And so reading that, I didn't expect, um, this weird, like cathartic experience reading about her teenage years, but I was like, wow, Okay, <laughs> that uh, reminds me of my own self, and and uh, so it was interesting to read, but but emotional. Um, but perhaps that's the point about delving into Marilyn's life. Perhaps different people can find things um, to sympathize with her, empathize, and realize, um, really start to think of her as a human being because she's been blown up, you know, as this big star. And what else? And of course, reading about her Hollywood years, it's all very interesting and fun, her process, her, um, to read about the movies, but she is always sensitive and always struggles. And um, like I said, Hollywood does exploit her, men exploit her, the men in Hollywood and her relationships, I would say she never has a good relationship. I think out of all her lovers and husbands, Arthur Miller was painted in the best light. Um, but even then, they're just, they're all difficult and you just feel bad for her. I don't think she ever really got the love she needed. And her later years are difficult. They start to spiral out of control. She, um, she's taking drugs and, and sadly it shows that, you know, her drug use is kind of, um, was started by the studio. They had these studio doctors and they just kept prescribing actors things just to, you know, because all the studio cared about was the actors being there and able to show up and do their job, you know. And so, because um, you see early in the book, Marilyn is portrayed as such an innocent, uh, much more innocent that you think that this, you know, sex symbol would be, but she's portrayed as so innocent in all ways and she doesn't want to take drugs and all of that. She doesn't want to drink. And I just think she kind of ends up well, corrupted in, in terms of the drugs, but um, in terms of being a sex symbol, I almost think she always, she 
became one and I exploited her sexuality. Um, but yet I always think there was an innocent part of Marilyn and re-watching her movies uh, and watching some for the first time, um, especially her early ones, you can see that innocence, but you can see that she does have this natural sexiness and they just took that and used it to make money. Um, but she did seem so innocent and, and I think I admired her for that. and just this innate quality she possessed and um it made me admire her a lot more than I did um I don't know why that is I guess yeah when I thought of her as just this like oversexed woman um I don't think I passed her off as silly and I didn't pay that much attention to her but then after reading this and realizing how serious she was about acting how smart she actually was like she loved to read and sometimes she would take some extra classes and stuff like that I just got this different image of her as smarter and with passion and more innocent um, but naturally sexy um, and she just got exploited and and um, of course she got cast in in films that the studios wanted her to be in to sell sex basically and I, I just found that kind of sad though um, so anyways I found more about her to connect with and more to admire and just I guess I came away uh, from this book with a very different opinion of her and that was really cool. So I really liked this book. There was a lot in here and I'm glad I got to learn more about Marilyn. I'm glad it inspired me to watch more of her movies and just to see her in a different light. And, um, and it was a sad book. It was a difficult book to read sometimes because her life wasn't easy. And, um, what else? Oh, an excuse. I'm hearing like neighbors like singing or playing music right now. It is a very loud day in LA to film the video. I will, I will say that. I don't know if I, sometimes I'll stop the video, but I don't know if they'll stop. So we're just going to hope that it doesn't pick up that much. I'll try to block out some background noise when I edit this. <sighs> Before this, I, I made this video a little later because of trash trucks. And now we got music. It's loud around here. <laughs> Maybe it's fitting for a video about books set in LA. You get the real experience. It's loud. People are always doing stuff. Um, anyway, so Marilyn. Yeah, so I just appreciate her more. Um, and yeah, but also feel sad for her and sad for what Hollywood does to women. Oh, and the ending of this was interesting. I don't really want to spoil it, but there is some history that can't really be spoiled, and that is that everyone thinks Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. And there is some controversy around that, and there is like a conspiracy theory of what actually happened, and Joyce Carol Oates goes with that ending, so that's all I will say, but I found that interesting, and it did um, get me thinking. Um, I will say, I think this was wonderfully done. My one complaint with the whole book now that I've um, talked about all the wonderful things is that Joyce Carol Oates changes names of like the famous people in this book a lot but not all the time and uh, I thought that was just unnecessary like we know who they are um you're talking about someone who was real and was famous so I thought that was odd because I just found myself trying to look things up to figure out who it was sometimes other times it was very obvious um and yeah that was just unnecessary but yeah, I do highly recommend Blonde, and I like Joyce Carol Oates' writing, and I want to check out more of her work now as well. Okay, so the next thing that I guess um, Los Angeles is known for is crime. Um, I guess that just happens with any city. There's a lot of crime, and it's a great place to set crime fiction. So the next book I have is In a Lonely Place by Dorothy B. Hughes, published in 1947. And this is like a noir um, crime classic. And I really enjoyed this. I'm not that big on crime. I tend to go more for the mystery genre. And I know there are differences. 
Um, but I am realizing, definitely classic mysteries, and um, I am realizing that I do actually like crime in a different way, um, but definitely classic crime as well. I don't think I would like either of those genres in a modern sense. Um, and this book had such beautiful writing for a crime novel, and that was one of the things I loved about it. Um, it the writing was great and it was moody and I very much enjoyed the reading experience of this novel. So this is about a man named Dick Steele and um, it's post World War II and he moves to Los Angeles and he's feeling very aimless. He's a war veteran and he doesn't know what to do with himself. He's living off, I believe it's his uncle's money. And he comes in contact again with his friend named Brub and they were in the war together and Brock now works for the LAPD and he is working on a big murder case that is a big deal in LA at the moment. Um, a man is preying on young women and strangling them. And so Dix hangs out with Brub more and becomes involved in this case. And uh, he also happens to fall in love with his sultry red-headed neighbor, Laurel Gray. And uh, Laurel ends up being in more danger than she realizes as well. And so this was so interesting and, you know, had me on the edge of my seat as you want a crime or mystery novel to do. And I don't know if this is a, um, a facet of crime novels, but this really got into the head of a criminal and you know to the point where you explore why a criminal would commit um, the type of crime and definitely the kind of misogynistic man that would prey on young women like this um, but also when you're in the mind of a criminal in a book like this it messes with you and that's what's so masterful about the writing is that it makes you kind of not sympathize with the criminal but you you get stressed out when they're going to be caught um and then you catch yourself and you're like no wait i want him to be caught like that's wrong um and that's so crazy it reminded me in that respect of the talented mr ripley by patricia highsmith which is a wonderful novel um but i found myself doing that a lot too in that book where i didn't want <laughs> the the criminal in that story to be caught and so I found myself kind of being mentally manipulated by this book in that way as well. And I will say, um, this book is probably different from other crime novels, and probably because it was written by a woman, because I feel like it ended up being slightly empowering for the women at the end, um, because you have this, this male criminal who's misogynistic, you know, and you've got a femme fatale like character perhaps in Laurel Gray as well as um, there's another female character that's quite important as well, um, Brub's wife. And at the end of the day, I won't spoil anything, but they end up being quite important and things end up on a more empowering note for them and I feel like that might not be normal for crime fiction. So there definitely is a turn that Dorothy B. Hughes is put in here. Um, so that was kind of nice and, and perhaps we well maybe not complete redemption for the women that got murdered but it's like it could have ended worse and this woman who usually be a femme fatale and maybe things wouldn't go well for her and this other woman as well you know they kind of save the day and um prevent further crimes from happening and so that was great and yeah, so this was really wonderful and very gripping for what it was and has me interested in Dorothy B. Hughes as well as just classic crime. Um, this was turned into a movie with, as you can see on my cover, uh, Humphrey Bogart. And I did watch the movie, it was good, but it didn't follow the book very much. I find that so much with old movies that are based on books, they really stray from the plot. I don't know why I feel like saying a movie is based on a book back in the day was just a very loose statement. It was kind of like, oh, we took one idea that we liked and then made up a whole new story. So that was what the movie was like, but it was enjoyable. Um, so.
Okay, so the next book I read was Gidget by Frederick Connor, which was published in 1957. And so this is another big part of California, and that is the beach scene. And this takes place in Malibu, which is just um, a bit north of LA on the coast. And um, this follows the almost 16 year old Gidget and she's given that nickname on account of her short stature and she becomes infatuated one summer with the beach scene in Malibu with surfing and with a boy named Boondoggy which uh, his name is really Jeff and she wants to grow up so quickly and she's hilarious you know and she has all the over dramatic feelings of love that teenagers have and you know but also she's just very active and loves surfing and is very excited about life and the beach and um it was a hilarious and adorable little book honestly and it captured the lingo of the time so perfectly as well that's what made it so funny in one respect and apparently this book is kind of what started the whole California beach scene that got so popularized, you know, with movies and music and all of that. I feel like that really became super popular in the 60s, so it was Gidget, I guess, that kind of kicked it off. And um, this was based on the life of a real girl, so Frederick Connor wrote this, and this is really about his daughter Kathy Connor. And I thought that was kind of weird in some respects that. Um, I guess the real Gidget's dad wrote this because she is interested, you know, in romance. There's a romance plotline. She talks about sex sometimes. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Um, when I read about it, it became less weird because apparently she kind of instigated him to write this. Like, she said something like, oh, I want to write a book about all this. And he was a writer, um, I think he was a screenwriter or something in Hollywood, so he was like, oh, I'll write it for you. Just uh, help me out, like, tell me about, you know, your life and what you're going through. And she even told him he could listen to phone conversations if he wanted, so he did that. Um, so I guess it's kind of less creepy because she wanted him to write it. Still kind of weird. Although I didn't really get a creepy vibe from this. Um, I actually thought it was really, really cute and very funny. And yes this would be fun to read if you were a teenager but it's kind of funny since it was written by an adult it's kind of funny like in hindsight and especially not living in this time period of the 50s it's just hilarious it captures an age um and a certain in in a certain time period and place so perfectly and in a way that's just um endearing and cute um so very fun for for what it was and I grew up watching the 1959 movie with Sandra Dee and also the TV show um, from the 60s with, um, what's her name, Sally Fields. Um, I grew up with both of those because my mom did. Um, she definitely grew up with the TV show. The movie came out the year she was born, so I guess it was still popular, you know, in her childhood. And so she introduced them to me, you know, she grew up and my mom grew up in Huntington Beach big surf scene so I, I'm sure you know the Gidget uh, movie and series were just very popular among her her age group and her peers and so she passed it on to me and um, eventually I found out there was a book so I had to read it for for this and I had a lot of fun re-watching the movie and um, I haven't finished watching re-watching the TV show but I have been and that's really cute too a lot funnier than I remembered and um and I love the dad in the tv show like he is just the greatest dad um so yeah lots of fun the next book I read was In America by Susan Sontag published in 2000 as well kind of funny like blonde um and this didn't take place too much in southern California a lot less than I thought going in but the sections set there were still interesting. So this is another fictionalized account of an actress, but an actress on the stage this time. In the late 19th century, a woman named Helena Majeska, uh, renamed Marnia in this novel, 
I don't know why authors feel the need to rename famous people, but oh well. And um, it starts out in Poland, she's a Polish actress, and she's very famous over there. And at one point though, she wants a new life, she wants to start over, she wants to start a small farming commune in Southern California, so she takes her husband, her son, and some of their friends, and that's what they do. Um, and they do that in Anaheim, which it's funny because that is in Orange County. So it's around where I grew up and I did not know, um, you know, that there were these little communities that were trying to farm back then. So that was another interesting part of Southern California, going farther back. Um, that was fun to learn about, but that also fails. And then she decides she wants to be the most famous actress on the American stage, and but to do it in English. So she learns English, tries to perfect her accent, and that's what she does, and she does become very famous. And this was such a wonderful novel. Um, its biggest theme would be that of you are not sentenced to have the life, you know, you think you have to have, or or whatever life you think you're stuck in, that you can always start over, have a new identity, a new life, a new dream. And I found that a very powerful theme throughout the book and to be so well explored. And I admired Marnia so much as a character and her characterization was wonderful. Um, her life is so adventurous, so wonderful, and she's so strong, so confident, so determined. So determined to have a new life and so able to see the possibilities and that she can have, you know, anything she wants, maybe like a new identity, a new life, um, a new dream, and that she didn't have to be sentenced to the life she was given. So I admired her a lot for that. There was so much about the stage and the theater with this book, which I loved, and about acting. And that's definitely Marnia's first love, although she is married um, to a man who is fictionally called Bogdan in this book. And he seems so wonderful. He is so supportive of her, and they're both very true to each other and loyal at heart. Um, I admired their marriage, but definitely in a friendship way. Um, what was sad about it though was that that's not where their passions lied, although I wouldn't say that I disapproved of it because it seemed like a really lovely thing, a really lovely friendship they had. But Marnie's passion really lies with a writer that they call Wizard in this book, and um, she does have a very tender love of him for a while. But she doesn't want him to stay with her because she wants her life to be uncomplicated. She does love Bogdan in a sense. Um, she has a son and she doesn't want Wizard to give up um, his writing life for her because she knows that her first love is the theater and she doesn't want to be selfish. Um, so there was that element to the story. And in terms of bringing to life time and place, this was so wonderful and I love it when a book does that. Um, and there was a lot of traveling in this book, and I love traveling through a book. Um, it first is set in the cities in Poland where Marnia acts, but also then this small mountain village called Sakopane. And then um, they travel on an ocean liner, which is described, and, um, and then of course in America, in New York a lot, and then of course in California both in Anaheim in Southern California and in San Francisco and in other places in the U.S. as well, such as um, what was once a very wealthy town in Nevada called uh, Virginia City. It was a mining town and I didn't know that much about it before, so this book kind of got me interested. And so I definitely felt like I had traveled in time and traveled through place. The novel started out really interestingly where it is as if Susan Sontag has traveled back in time and is watching these characters from the outside in. Um, but then after that, when she jumps into their story, she does it so well and, and we as readers are really transported. So I love this book in terms of theme, characters, exploration of the theater and acting and as a historical fiction novel, you know, set in a certain time and in different places. Um, settings. They were done wonderfully. 
So I think this was my favorite of the bunch, I will say that. And I really enjoyed all of them for what they all were, everything that I've read in this, um, that I'm sharing in this video, they all are wonderful, but this impacted me the most and will probably stay with me the most. The last book I read was kind of a deviation, um, a bit from the theme because I, um, went to Catalina Island in July because my mom got married there and Catalina Island is an island you know just like an hour boat ride off the coast of Southern California so it kind of fit in with the Southern California theme so I wanted to find something set there to read however I did not find something set there to read but a um a famous author lived there and you can stay in his home it is now a hotel uh, i didn't stay there but that actually is where my mom and her new husband stayed so i did get to see the hotel which was cool and uh, that is zane gray so i decided to read one of his books so i guess him as a writer fits in with like the southern california theme and with catalina island which i ended up at recently um but his book is not set there. Zane Grey was a well-known writer of westerns, um, which is kind of a new genre for me. And uh, so the book I read is Writers of the Purple Sage, and this was published in 1912, but it was set in the 1870s. And so uh, it was set in Utah and followed two men and two women, basically. So it starts out following a woman named Jane, and she is a Mormon woman, and um, she is kind of started to be um, and treated as an outcast from the Mormon community because she befriends um, Gentiles, I think they're called, which basically means non-Mormons. and. One of the elders of her church who i think is kind of in love with her or wants her to be one of his wives um is very angry about this and so he wants to ruin her and so he starts you know um taking her cattle and kind of like all her employees and ranchers kind of um taking them back into his fold and away from protecting her and her land and um, in comes a man named, named Lassiter who has kind of an intimidating reputation and he is in search of some revenge and uh, we learn a little bit about his story and why he is seeking revenge as well. But uh, he takes a liking to Jane and he wants to protect her. She sort of softens him and they fall in love. And, um, and then on the other hand there's a man named Venters who is one of the non-Mormons that was working for Jane. And when these rustlers steal Jane's cattle, he goes off on his own journey to try and find them. And he ends up meeting a woman named Bess under mysterious circumstances and falling in love with her. So there's these two couples and two love stories. And um, this book was an interesting exploration, definitely at this time and place. Um, in Utah was um, where more, uh, the Mormon pioneers settled for the most part, so um, that's why there's a lot of Mormon characters. Jane is Mormon. Um, but early Mormonism had a lot of problems because um, they were polygamous and also because of that men were very, very dominant. And so we explore some of the problems with this male dominant um, society through the Mormon women, Jane, who's kind of at their mercy, and also through the eyes of the non-Mormons who are looking at this from an outside perspective. And also, of course, we get kind of an exploration of the Wild West, its lawless ways, you know, kind of there's a search for gold. It maybe is a minor plot point, but still, it's in there, you know, the, the ranchers, the the rustlers that try to steal the cattle, just the need to protect their land because things are more lawless and all of that. And also the setting was described very beautifully. I love a good, <laughs> a good setting description and the lush purple sage was so lovely. Um, Jane's property was described well with all the cottonwood trees 
Um, the place where Venters goes, a place called Surprise Valley with its like rock formation seemed really cool and beautiful. And um, in that valley, there's these old dwellings left in the cliff from these native cliff dwellers that I think are pretty ancient. And um, there's a description of that, and which I ended up looking up. Um, I didn't know about them before. And that seemed really cool, so some fabulous description. And I was very interested in the characters. I liked them. Um, I liked that there was romance in this. I didn't expect there to be romance. That was very fun, the romantic plot lines. And um, I thought the female characters were great. I did not expect that in a western. They were both very interesting females, very strong and very kind of different, I would say. And yeah, so I enjoyed reading this western. I expected there to be a lot of action, to be a very like manly book. And I was surprised because there was there was some action, but there was a lot of plot, and yeah, and great writing and description, and the female characters were great. There was romance, and there's a lot more to it. So I really enjoyed this once again for what it was, and I do want to read more Zane Grey, and maybe more of the Western genre. I don't know if all of the Western genre would be would have all these elements that I like so much about this. So maybe that's just Zane, but. I definitely will continue to explore this genre and um, same great as a writer so I'm glad I picked this up and so I know it wasn't set in California but had that uh, Zane Grey had that tie to California. And I will say before I finish this video talking about old books this um, is from 1912 it might be a first edition I'm not sure if there ever was a dust jacket or not um, but I was really happy to find this um, this little scene is kind of faded. I don't know if the camera will focus, but you can see the purple sage. Um, oh, there's some pictures. I'll show you a picture. And this book, it smells super good and old for all you book nerds out there like me who are sniffing books all the time. I don't think that's a good picture. I want to find a good one. There's not tons, but they're cool. Oh, here we go. So that's really cool. And then on that note, the other book that I had that was old was Gidget. Um, so again, Gidget was published in 1957. So this is a 1958 paperback version, and this is like a movie cover version. And there's Sandra Dee on the cover, and this paperback is in good condition. The hardback of this is so cute, but those are really expensive. This was really cheap, but still very original and just, yeah, adorable. So those are some vintage books that made their way into my reading, which I have been trying to, when I read an old book, if I can find an old copy that I like and that is affordable, and if I can find one, because in a lonely place, I will say I looked for that. I couldn't even find one. Um, so yeah, if I can, I'm trying to make that my goal so um, that I get to have a larger old book collection and just it makes the experience really fun um, to read from the actual, you know, book from that, um, from when it came out. It makes the experience really complete, but I love old things, you know. So those are the books I read that are associated with or set in Southern California and it was a really fun experience and now I'm going to go back to some like normal reading not themed reading and just kind of make my way down my to read list um, for a little while but I'll have a ne um, my next video out I don't know if I'll let it go like a month or or a little bit longer but um, it won't be themes, but whatever books I have read, you know, going down my to read list in the next little while, I will make a video about and we'll have another tea time. So have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Bye.